Excellent. All right. Thanks, Christine. Um, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. It's my pleasure to be here. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, and I agree, this is definitely, you know, a celebration and a time to kind of look forward to, to a new future. And I love the, the title that we kind of came up with as we discussed what we're going to call this in Great Expectations. And I've been able to kind of engage some of my classical English background from before I was in medical school to enhance some of that. And we'll talk about those. So I'm going to share my presentation. <clears throat> I've tried to keep this, you know, I'm hoping the whole presentation will take less than half of, of our time tonight so that there's lots of time for questions. Um, <clears throat> Christine's going to be watching the, the, um, the chat box and the question answer box. And I think if, you know, if there's a pressing urgent question for, related to what we're talking about, then Christine can kind of jump in and get me. Otherwise, you know, I'm hoping there's lots of time at the end for, uh, for questions. Um, so with that, um, I wanted to throw this up there. I mean, Christine kind of mentioned, you know, the, the, the medical director of our provincial bleeding disorders program. I'm one of the pediatric clinic uh, co-directors with Dr. Israels. Um, but when we do scientific presentations, we always give our kind of disclosures, our conflicts of interest. Um, and, you know, in discussing, you know, in hearing kind of the advocacy that's happened for, uh, for Hemlieber, which is what we're going to talk about tonight for Emicizumab, um, I honestly have a huge conflict of interest on multiple levels. So I thought I'm going to just put those out there. So <clears throat> From the patient side, you know, I, I'm a past president of our of the Association of Hemophilia Clinic Directors of Canada. Um, as I stepped down from that, I actually stepped on as the medical liaison for the Canadian Hemophilia Society. So I, I worked very closely with the National Patient Organization, as well as provincially with, with the Manitoba chapter. Um, I recently became a member of the Blood and Safety and Supply Committee of CHS, so I'm part of their advocacy efforts. Uh, on the flip side of that... <clears throat> I was actually one of the two medical expert representatives uh, for CADA, the Canadian Association of Drugs in Therapy and Health, when they reviewed amicizumab to decide uh, whether this was something that was reasonable to add to the national formulary. So, um, so I got to kind of represent from the medical perspective the values of, of amicizumab. Um, and I've also worked with, with a few of the companies um, most relevant to this talk with, with Roche, who makes him, this is a man. Um, and I think my first experience with them was uh, actually representing the, as, as their independent medical expert when they went to talk to Health Canada about getting an expedited review of, of emesizumab. So, so for me, you know, I declare these as disclosures, but I've always said, you know, as I, I don't do these things because somebody asked me to do them. I do them because I believe in them. Um, and clearly this is, this is a, a treatment option that that you know myself and you know all the treaters in Canada and really North America have believed in for a long time, and we're very glad to see it uh, finally get out there. So, with that in mind, so what I want to talk about really today, and I hope there's lots of questions we can discuss this, um, is first talk about what we what we know about Hem Libra, talk a little bit about what we don't know about Hem Libra, uh, and then in the context of all of that. Um, talk about how does this fit into what we do with hemophilia A patients. Um, and really, I have a lot of questions that I'll kind of share with you as, as these are things we're all still learning. All the treaters are kind of learning where does this fit into our treatment, our treatment armamentarium. So, so moving along with Dickens, I really, as I thought about this talk, I realized this is a case of it's the best of times, it's the worst of times. Uh, now I pulled up that, that quote, it goes a lot further, I love it. It's uh, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief, it was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. So, you know, Tale of Two Cities, I think it speaks in some ways to our world right now as we struggle through the, the second, you know, full year of the pandemic. But, you know, I look at Hemlibra, it, it's the best, we have this wonderful new drug and now we're struggling with, okay, how does it, how does it fit in um, where does it work? We've come through the, how do we even get it available for our patients? So looking at, you know, current, what we do for hemophilia, where are the, where are the outline needs? And this is, um, I was actually part of a, of the, a focus group and a paper that came out of this, looking at kind of unmet needs in hemophilia. Um, you know, and we, we know this, I'm, I'm speaking to people who know this at a, at a very personal level, you know, IV, IV administration is not convenient. Um, frequent administration, you know, three to three times a week to every other day to daily is not convenient. It's not, it's not a good quality of life. Um, we need better bleed protection. Um, and we'll talk a little when we look at the evidence for Hemlibra, how tricky that is to, to quantify nowadays. But um, certainly in inhibitor patients, you know, we need a better bleed protection. And then there's the whole issue of inhibitors. If you have an inhibitor, 
if you're at risk of getting an inhibitor. So, you know, in, in the classic stuff we had, factor replacement therapy, these were all things that we, we needed, we needed to, solutions to. Um, and the bunch line of that is with, with emicizumab, with Libra, we have a clinically effective pro product that's also better to give it gives you a better quality of life. And when you look at the inhibitor population, um, it's also from a, from a pure Canadian blood services provincial perspective, uh, Hemlibra was less expensive than bypassing agents and high dose ITI. Um, so I always said that was the trifecta. You had something that was cost effective, clinically effective, and had a good, good quality of life. You can't get better than that. So what is emicizumab or Hemlibra? So I suspect, again, everybody knows this. This is, you know, this has been the worst kept secret in hemophilia for a few years now. Um, so it is what we call a factor eight mimetic. So it mimics factor eight without being factor eight. So it is a humanized bispecific factor 9a, factor 10 antibody. So um, I'm hoping my pointer shows up. The job of factor eight is to bring together clotting factor, activated clotting factor nine with clotting factor 10 to activate clotting factor 10. If factor eight can't do that, we have emicizumab that can do that. So one arm of the antibody grabs factor 9a, the other arm grabs factor 10, pulls them together and does the job of factor eight. So it, it is factor eight. It replaces the factor eight in the cascade, but it isn't factor eight. So it's not affected by inhibitors. It doesn't cause inhibitors. So works well, gets around the whole inhibitor issue. Now, here we go. Another, another unexpected Dickens quote, which is take nothing on its looks, take everything on evidence. So, you know, emicizumab looks like it should be good, um, but what does the evidence actually show us? And this is one slide summarizing a lot of work on, on Hemlibra. So this is the, the Haven series of, of studies. Um, and I've quickly kind of summarized in there what the studies were. So Haven one was persons with hemophilia who are over 12 with inhibitors. Um, and 63% had no treated bleeds. One third had no bleeds. And compared to only 8% of patients who weren't on any prophylaxis. So if you compared prophylaxis with Hemlibra versus no prophylaxis inhibitor patients, significantly better. Haven 2 is basically the same study, but with kids. Most of those kids were previously on prophylaxis um, and their annualized bleeding rate. So an average of how many times they bleed per month averaged out over the year was zero. And 87% of them had no treated bleeds. So then we go to the non-inhibitor group. So the patients are greater than 12 without inhibitors. Um, a little bit of a, you know, the, the Haven 3 had multiple different branches to it. So, you know, the comparison here, the annualized bleeding rate of 1.5 on emicizumab prophylaxis versus 38.2% on no prophylaxis is a little bit disingenuous because we, we know prophylaxis is better than no prophylaxis. Um, but still, I mean, clearly demonstrated that, you know, things were much better instead of bleeding 38 times a year or roughly three times a month, you're bleeding one and a half times a year. 96% um, reduction in your risk and almost two thirds didn't have any treated bleeds. Um, the arm in um, patients on prophylaxis, with, they compared themselves to themselves. So how much did they bleed before they started? They switched from their regular prophylaxis to emicizumab and how much did they bleed after? And the annualized bleeding rate dropped by two thirds. So that's what we like to see is that, you know we know prophylaxis is good, but this is evidence that emicizumab prophylaxis is better. Um, the Haven 4 study really looked at just the variable dosing that I'll come to in a minute. So to put some of that in a table, which doesn't really project well, uh, these, are, these are the inhibitor patients. Um, I like this issue of patients with zero bleeds. Um, and this was something we actually, we talked about a lot at, um, at the CADIF level when we were doing these reviews. Um, and I know, you know from, from you know, the, my medical liaison and blood safety supply committee kind of roles, this was a challenge you know, in, the, in the Quebecois submission for, for Hemlibra is when you're on prophylaxis and you're dealing with annualized bleeding rates of you know, one to 1 1.5, it's hard to show things are better, right? You, you know, we, we, there was never anything wrong with factor replacement therapy for patients without inhibitors. It's good therapy. So how do you show it's better? How do you show something's better when your measurement and annualized bleeding rate, you know, how do you show, how is going from 1.1 to 0 0.9 better enough to convince a government that they should be paying more money for these things? Um, and that's why I like this idea of patients with zero bleeds, because I think that was a novel way of looking at things. It's not, let's not say, you know, what, how, how often do you bleed on average per year? Let's say, you know, how many of you just don't bleed at all? 
you know, and again, these are inhibitor patients who we know bleeding is an issue. Um, and with, you know, emesizumab, 63% of them don't bleed, patients over the age of 12. Um, that's, that's no treated bleeds. 37% had, um, sorry, this just breaks it down. But I, it's, it's just, it's an interesting metric. It's a different way of looking at things because, you know, the, the challenge we had as we've advocated for uh, Hemlibra, particularly for the non-inhibitor patients, is when the current treatment is already really good, how do you show that it's better? And I think the zero bleeds was a, was a clever way to do it. Um, safety concerns with, with Hemlibra. So the big ones actually came out in Haven 1, uh, and that was thrombotic microangiopathy. So these are, are multiple tiny little clots, as well as some really big clots. Uh, and what they found was they were happening in, they happened in five patients. It was enough to get some attention and, and, and some intervention and really good looking at what, what's different. And what they found was all these patients were using a bypassing agent. They were using FIBA, APCC, at more than 100 units per kilo per day. Um, and what they found is in patients who had more than that dose, they got the clots. In patients who had less than that dose or none, they didn't get the clots. So there was a pretty clear signal there. Uh, which led to what we call a black box warning. So this is where a prescriber or a patient, if you look on the insert, there's a big black box that says, do not use APCC at doses greater than 100 units per kilo per day. Um, and what this did for us is we started using this for inhibitor patients was a lot of changing education because inhibitor patients, uh, well, all hemophilia patients are told, if you think you're bleeding, treat. Well, we had to change that, that story a little bit because when you're on emicizumab, you know, you may be achy because you're doing more. It may not be a bleed. And we need to think a little differently about those symptoms because just treating because you think you might be bleeding could actually put you at risk when you when you have inhibitors using FIBA. The other thing we did was got the FIBA out of the house. So it's, you know, we take, take away the opportunities to kind of fall back on old, very familiar patterns, which have suddenly become dangerous because the new prophylaxis just works in such a different way. All right, so all that brings us to Hemlibra. And now we're gonna kind of focus on, on, you know, what does it mean in kind of clinical use? So it's been approved by Health Canada for hemophilia A patients with and without inhibitors now for several years. Um, you know, as many of you may know, and this is again, speaks to the advocacy, approval by Health Canada just means they've decided that this drug is safe um, and that it, it is a drug that could be used by patients in Canada. Um, the next step, for, for, hem, for Hemlibra is to get it on the CBS inventory. Um, so our treatment products, treatment products for patients with, with bleeding disorders have all come through Canadian Blood Services. Those are, that inventory is under the kind of oversight of the Provincial and Territorial Blood Liaison Committee. So all of the ministers of health at the different provinces are overseeing that. Uh, so when something, when Canadian Blood Services says, hey, we've got something new we want to put on the inventory, it ultimately has to be approved by all the provinces. And that took some time. So originally, it was approved only for the inhibitor patients. And as I mentioned before, it was, it was the trifecta. We had something that was cheaper than the current inhibitor management, worked better, and was more convenient. You can't get better than that. Um, and Roche was very, very generous in opening up a compassion access program for the non-inhibitor patients while they were waiting for wider availability. So there were uh, you know, a few patients across the country who were able to get access to it. Uh, the CADETH review happened, took a very long time to get through the review. Um, and the ultimate recommendation was that this was a drug that should be carried, um, but they put a little bit of a, almost a blanket cost stipulation on it. But basically that said, it should be almost cost equivalent. It shouldn't cost that much more than the least expensive factor eight molecule which launched the next round of advocacy to say that's not really a valid comparator. Um, so it, it took a bit of time there, but you know, Cadeth at least acknowledged that this was a drug that had advantages. It was a drug that was reasonable to carry then came up to their own mandate, which is you know, the, the, the quality of life argument is a very challenging one for regulators to make. Um, so that's where the advocacy comes in from the patients and the physicians and the nurses and, and the community. Um, and, you know, as you all know, it is now available for all severe hemophilia A patients. So that is a very strict limit too. And we're going to talk about that in a minute is it's severe is only less than 1%. So that takes us to Hemlibra. So, you know, how do we use Hemlibra? And I was going to, the, the nurses actually had brought me the, um, the Hemlibra injection teaching kit because I thought, oh, I'll bring it and show you. 
it's huge. It's this enormous like shipping box. So I decided not to bring it because I wasn't sure it was going to help and it was a lot bigger than my computer camera was going to catch. So how do we use Hemlever? Well, it's subcutaneous. So we don't, uh, we don't need to give it through an intravenous. Uh, we give it under the skin with a small, uh, you know, small gauge needle. It's similar to giving, you know, giving insulin. It's similar to giving other sub-Q shots. Um, the most common thing they found in Haven uh, was injection site reactions. So people would get sore, it would sting, it would itch, they'd get a bit of a rash, bruising. Um, dosing, you get a weekly loading dose for four weeks. And then this is what Haven 4 showed us is that, you know, giving one and a half milligrams per kilo every week, three milligrams per kilo every two weeks, or six milligrams per kilo every four weeks was just as good. Now, the, every four weeks is only approved in the adult world. Um, and where we've actually started using this as we're preparing to roll this out is balancing the vial sizes. So, you know, with our first crop of pediatric patients who are getting ready for this, I, I sat down and I looked at what their weekly dose was, and I tried to figure out what the closest vial was to it and whether it was better to do it every week or every two weeks so that we didn't have as much wastage. Um, and that's something that was, uh, and I know uh, Dr. Rimmer on the adult side has actually come across this some, we call them band dosing, where it basically says, rather than try and go exactly per kilo, let's figure out what, what range you are in so that we give you the number of vials that fits the best with what you need. Um, so bottom line with all of this is when you get it, it's, it's a steady state equivalent of about having a trough of 15 to 25% age. Really imprecise as I, I tried to actually find a better paper that had some kind of arc numbers to it. But you know, we know after the four week load, the level of hemlever in your blood is fairly steady. And it's equivalent to about having 15 to 25% age. So you become a mild hemophiliac, which is, you know, the goal of current prophylaxis is to turn you from a severe to a mild level. So or severe to moderate level, sorry. So that's how we use it. Um, so the big questions, now we, as we head into the questions, sorry, Mike, there we go. So, well, what happens when you bleed? Well, you still bleed on Hemlibra. So mild hemophilia patients still bleed. So acute bleeding events will still happen on Hemlibra. Um, so even when you're on it, it's important to remember that injuries can lead to bleeding. Uh, you could still have spontaneous, uh, spontaneous bleeds, Less common given that you're having a trough that sits around 15%, but it could happen. Um, if you do bleed, factor eight still works. So, you know, there's a lot of concern, as I mentioned, about the prothrombin complex concentrates, the, the bypassing agents. But if you use factor eight, factor eight will outcompete Hemlibra by about a hundred fold. So if you have Hemlibra and factor eight, the factor eight is much stronger at getting to factor nine. So you're not going to overactivate. They won't kind of add together and cause clot um, from what we've seen in, in the Haven studies and real world studies. Um, so you can still use your factor eight, which does mean that patients are still going to have to have emergency doses, right? We're, we're looking at that now as we kind of, as we shift patients over to Hemlever to make sure everybody's going to have to have a couple of vials sitting around in case they bleed. Uh, the challenge with that is, you know, home care skills decline without practice. If you're not infusing once or twice or three times a week, and you're now infusing maybe twice a year, your infusion skills may not be so sharp anymore. <laughs> Sorry, no pun intended. Um, so this may be more trips to the emergency department. Um, this may be more assistance. This may be um, slightly more delayed uh, getting treatment just because you're gonna need to do that. Uh, I know they're, they're looking at, at untreated patients um, as we talk about inhibitor risks and doses uh, that, that Patients, if we start patients who've never been treated before on Hemlibra, they may be teenagers before they've had 20 doses of factor eight because it's, it's that good. It's only gonna happen when you generally have an injury. All right, so what about surgery? That's the other, the other question. So the Haven study did look at that, um, not as in a specific way, but patients on Haven who had surgery. And basically what they found was that minor surgery could be safely done without needing more factor. So for minor procedures, for dental work, um, for, for minor, minor surgical procedures, you probably don't need extra factor eight. For major surgeries, you're probably still gonna need factor eight. So prophylactic and post-operative. So if you're having joint replacement, uh, you know, you're on Hemlibra, your bleeding is better controlled. Now it's time to deal with, with your chronic joints. You're probably gonna need factor for that. Again, it's safe to do it, um, but you will still need it. Um, which brings to this issue of what about testing? So. Uh, we've actually prepared a letter that as people go to Hemlibra, they're going to get to take with them. 
because you can't do routine coagulation testing when you have Hemlibra on board. So if you're on Hemlibra and you go into the emergency department and they decide they're gonna send off a PTT on you to look at your clotting levels, it's gonna be ridiculously short or ridiculously long because the machine will miss it completely. So you need special reagents. We have those reagents. Um, I, I've described it there. So they're chromogenic. So they work by changing color as opposed to by forming a clot. And they actually have to be cow reagents. So they use bovine plasmas instead of, instead of the, the human plasmas we typically use um, because it doesn't cross react. So our lab can do it. Dr. Israels has set up the lab. It's there, um, but it's, it's a more expensive test. It's not something that's gonna be available on routine time. So we need to kind of be aware that if, if we need to test a patient on Hemlibra, we need to plan that ahead of time. And generally that'll be in the context of the surgery. All right, one more kind of thing to think about with inhibitors. So we've said, you know, Hemlibra doesn't cause inhibitors. It's not affected by inhibitors. Well, what about immune tolerance? If you have an inhibitor? Uh, lots of discussion about this, but the general consensus among the treaters is that there's still value in getting rid of those inhibitors, right? As I just mentioned, if you're gonna have surgery or you're gonna have an acute injury, it's still nice to be able to use factor and not have to worry about, oh my goodness, what if I do need to have a prothrombic complex concentrate? Um, the big thing I see with, with immune tolerance is there's not the urgency anymore. So, you know, there's lots of different ways we can do immune tolerance. Um, and we typically, you know, our practice has always been kind of the high dose where we get big doses every day. We need a central line to do it. And it takes, you know, six months to 18 months before we might see something. Um, you know, we don't have to be so urgent because when you have an inhibitor now, you've got good bleeding control. Um, so we can go to a lower dose. We can go to a less urgent way of doing it, or we can just not use factor. Like we know many inhibitors, particularly the lower tighter ones, if we just don't give you any factor eight, they're going to go away. Your immune system will forget. So, you know, because we have Hemlibra to give good bleeding control, we don't have to panic the same way about getting rid of that inhibitor. Um, last question that I had, which many people maybe think I throw another Dickens quote in there is what about the non-severes? Um, and, you know, my, my, I call them non-severe. Actually, my colleague in the UK, you know, he, he talks about this a lot. He doesn't talk about mild, moderate, severe. He talks about severe and non-severe. And he really looks at the phenotype. How do they bleed? Um, because, you know, we know factor level is only one part of the picture and probably not the main part of the picture. Um, you know, and what I wanted to say here is really that, you know, the, the moderates and milds have not been forgotten. Uh, advocacy is ongoing. We want to expand access. When the, when the initial kind of decision came that it would be provided for patients with a factor rate of less than 1%, you know, immediately the discussion started, well, what if you're 2% but you bleed like a severe patient? Um, and that's that last bullet I've got there. Um, you know, I've got this scene from Oliver Twist in there, the pleaser I want some more, um, to kind of reflect where we're, we're all kind of sitting right now on this very precarious balance of, you know, the community is thrilled that Hemlever is now available. Um, and at the same time, knowing that we have more patients who will benefit from it. But it's a little bit of that, we, we have to be careful how much we ask for at this point. So I think patients who are greater than 1% who should be on Hemlever, uh, the individual patients and clinicians can put in a special request through Canadian Blood Services. It may or may not be approved. I think right now what we're really doing is let's let's get the patients who really need to be on this on it as quickly as we can as we continue to kind of push for, for the non-severe patients. So those are kind of the big questions. And I think, you know, as we think about how does this all fit into what we do for hemophilia, um, I thought, you know, here, here's really the way I look at the bottom line, uh, which is, as I've said many times, this is a very exciting and a very effective prophylactic option for our patients. Um, but the other thing, and this is the point I've made as I've talked to patients as we switch them over now, this is not a cure. It feels like a cure. I've heard that from lots of patients uh, and families that it feels like you're cured, um, but you're not. And I think that's the key to, to talk about. When I, when I teach residents and medical students about patients with hemophilia, I often say the, the patients who tend to worry me the most are actually the mild patients because they still bleed. They just they don't bleed often enough that they think about it. So it's, it's not a part of their life that they remember. So, you know, but, but when something happens, they still need that management. So I think that's, you know, that big point, this isn't, this isn't a cure, but it is a very, very good treatment option.
Um, the last point up there is kind of part of the emerging you know, real world use that we're starting to discover is that factory may have other things to do. You know, we've always looked at it as it's part of the clouding cascade. Um, but there's some, some evidence that it may have actual maintenance of bone health functions. Um, and that, you know, the, the bone and joint damage that we see in bleeding with factor eight deficiency, some of it's from the bleeding and some of it may actually be the factor eight deficiency itself. And we've never been able to tease that apart because, you know, you bleed because of factor eight deficiency. But we're now at a point where we're stopping the bleeding without replacing the factor eight. We may uncover things that factor eight did that we never realized was happening. So, you know, I, I'm not too concerned about this right now, but I think this is, as, as that last point says, real world experience is gonna help us tease out, you know, what, what were we seeing that was from the bleeding and what were we seeing that was actually the factor eight in and of itself. So, you know, it, it's an interesting time. Again, this gets back to the, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Um, you know, we have this incredibly exciting option that, that has potentially new, new risks and new downsides to it. So that was what I what I wanted to bring to you. I found one more Dickens quote, um, which uh, to bring us to the discussion part, which is the worst of all listeners is the man who does nothing but listen. And I just thought that was kind of a cool quote as I was looking. And I will finish. I want to just finish with my favorite cartoon slide, because this is I always tell people when you ask people if you have any questions, you have to be careful what you're asking. This isn't Dickensian, but <laughs> so so with that, I will say thank you. I got my little blood drop, man. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for, for your attention and listening. I think I did it right on. It's exactly 7.30, so <laughs> try to watch. So I, yeah, like I said, I think Christine's gonna moderate the questions. I will, I will do my best to answer the questions. Um, so yeah, I can put them either in the chat or the Q&A box, and I know people have sent some in. Yeah. I will stop my share. Okay, we have some, uh, thank you. That was wonderful. We, we have some very good questions. Um, some that were sent in beforehand, and some that have come in since. Um, and, and these are very practical questions that we have. So um, the first one is we might get, um, how good is the non-refrigerated shelf life of Heme Libra? So that's a practical, how, how should yeah. we expect to have to look after that, this medication? I, I, honestly, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> that, that is a great question. Um, I don't actually know. I just think I may, I may, I may look in the background <laughs> we're talking but it does can... require refrigeration right it's not yeah like... I'm yeah yeah I'll look it up i will look it up as we're hang on because so i mean and this is part of where we're looking at um at um like doses and vials because it's um you know we want to make sure we're not giving you too much storage and stability uh store the vials in the refrigerator do not freeze do not shake uh, once removed from the refrigerator, so you can keep it up at room temperature for seven days. So that's pretty good. I don't know. I mean, I, I'm assuming the shelf life in the fridge is um, likely months, if not years. Yes. So seven days cumulative it. time at room temperature. Yeah. Yeah. So if you take it out of your fridge, you got seven days to use it. Um, you know, the vials are tiny. We're trying, like, they, so they come as it's 30, 60. 105 and 150. There's some very odd vial sizes. And the 30, you can't mix with anything else. So this is part of where we've sat down and kind of gone, you know, what's the closest vial size we can get or mix of vial sizes we can get. Um, but also, you know, not, you don't have 500 vials sitting in your fridge. So again, a practical question. Do you, um, like with what, like some of the factor eight products, um, your supplies come in the product box. Is that what, what users should expect with Heme Libra? You know, another great question, and I'm not, I don't know, so. Okay, no. These are, these are, these are the, these are, <laughs> what's that? I'll answer that question for you. Okay, um, there you go. Oh, yeah, I was gonna say, you, you probably know. So. Yeah, I do know how the I, I, I don't, I, you know, I know how it works. I just don't know what comes in the box. <laughs> <laughs> no, you get your product, you get your supplies directly from Roche. So your um, your syringes, your very tiny needles, and, and will come will come directly from the company to you through their patient program. <laughs> there you go. Thank um, you. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, does Hemila does Heme Libra have a half life? So like a factor eight product, does it have a half life? And 
and does it work differently for each individual? So we don't think so. I'm just, I'm trying to, you know, great question. I'm trying to look up the pharmacokinetics on the monograph, but I can't find it. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, the half-life is an interesting one. I mean, the half-life is about seven days. Um, and I'm saying that because that's the way the dosing works, right? So we're, you know, when, when you load, you're taking it from seven days. What you get to though is the steady state. Like that, that's where that load comes from. Is so you take it kind of weekly for four weeks and then you you kind of push yourself quickly up to your steady state. Um, and then and then you're at steady state. So the half-life would be about seven days, seven to ten days probably. I can't yeah, I can't find it now. Um sorry, what was the other question? The other part of that one? Oh, does it work? It doesn't you know how um people respond differently to the to factor eight products? Do should do individuals respond differently to heme labor? We don't think so. So hang on, I found the other monograph too. I will get you the let me get the half life in a second. <laughs> so so I mean from what we've seen, the and this is what the Haven 4 kind of showed that the Interpatient variability is minimal. So it, it's a very predictable, uh, it's the very predictable half-life predictable pharma. We call it pharmacokinetics, which is the way the way it reacts in your body. Um, and that's where we get the uh, that's where we, we get that kind of you can use it up to you know 1.5 milligrams per week or twice as much every two weeks or twice as much half as often or four times as much one quarter as often. So it's very predictable with, with minimal kind of interpatient variability. Um, oh, and now this is a very important question. Uh, when should we expect that it'll be available to patients here in Manitoba? So it, it is. Um, so it, it is available. So as of October 18th, we can start, uh, it, it's a name patient contract. So. Um, you know, when, when you come to clinic, what we're trying to do is uh, get everybody into clinic kind of as quickly as we can. So we've, you know, I know Tracy and Crystal Ann have kind of looked through everybody. We, we haven't, we, and we know everybody wants to go on it. We know who's there. And we've tried to kind of figure out how to get everybody into clinic in a way that we can, you know, on the peep side, on the adult side, we can meet with them. We can talk with you, explain what it is. And then if everything is good, we do the, the contract, then it gets submitted to Canadian Blood Services. Uh, they look at supply and get it ready to uh, get it ready to come. So we submit that. We submit the prescription. We, they let us know when it's when there's available supply for those patients, and then we look at okay, what's left in your home supply? We'll switch you over. So it is available. You know, it's not available in a way. I know um, you know Roche has kind of said to Canadian Blood, you know, there is adequate inventory to supply everybody who wants it um, but it's not all in-house there isn't enough in Canada right now for every Canadian patient who wants this to get on it so it is going to be a bit of a, a staged rollout and I know this is something um, the HCDC and the CHS the blood safety supply committee David Page and Canadian blood services are what there's a meeting once a week that I'm not part of because I go to enough meetings um, but there's a weekly meeting where they kind of look at What's the supply? What's the demand? How many people have submitted a contract? Um, you know, I, I know, I think the anticipation was it would be about 30 to 40 per patients per month ac across Canada who would go on this. Um, I suspect they're going to be surprised. I know when I first heard that from, from the Blood Safety Supply Committee, I kind of said, you know, in Manitoba, we've got 15 patients who want to go on it this month. Um, so that has been fed back up the line too. Like I know they're, they're watching very closely at you know, what, we've, what we're doing is submitting the contract. As soon as we have a patient who we've talked to them, they're ready to switch, they're interested in switching, we submit the contract. If it's not available for a month, at least CBS knows we need it. Um, and it creates the numbers where you can say, you know, if things really start slowing down. But, you know, our goal is to get everybody who wants to switch, and we've estimated there's about 60 patients in, in our program, get them all switched over the next six to nine months. So now you, you mentioned that there are four weekly uh, loading doses. Right. Are those done in, in the hospital or at what point are you transferred to home management? So I know we've, we've worked at doing the, um, getting the easy start. So, and maybe I'm naming that wrong, but there's a, there's a patient support program available with, with Hemlibra that can actually go to the home and do that. 
I think by, by the official rules in the monograph, those first four shots are meant to be supervised. Um, so I think, you know, once it's developed, we're trying to get the first one, either we do it in, in the clinic, you know, Tracy or Crystalline does it, or we get the easy start in. But those, those first few shots, we, we want to have them observed, but you don't have to come into the hospital once a week to do it. Um, and, you know, the truth is, I, I remember when I first heard about that, I'm like, it's subcutaneous shots, they're easy. Like compared to, you know, I mean, you, this is a patient group. I, I mean, I'm seeing you guys, I can't see anybody but Christine, but I know you're all out there. Um, but like, this is a patient population that knows how to do home IV infusions, often self IV infusion. Learning to do a sub Q poke is going to be nothing. Like it's, it's I, easy. I, and you know how to drop meds. Like this is, I don't think this is a big learning curve for you guys. So you know, I, I think you underestimate though, um, <laughs> I, from conversations with other members, how um, how foreign this will be in the beginning to do a sub oh, yeah. because we have been doing IVs all this time, and of course, other people say, "I can't believe you do that." So, so I think there will be a little bit of a learning curve. <laughs> no, it's, it, yeah, I suppose that's true. It's once you once you realize it's the, it's it's a different way of doing things, but. I think, you know, I think those four weekly loading doses, everybody will pick it up and we've got the easy start to help with that or whatever the program, I'm, if I've got the wrong name for the program, whoever's listening, who knows the right name, will either put it in the chat box or just forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what, this is another question that um, has come up from many different people in conversations I've had with members as we've looked forward to this, um, is that how, how can you differentiate between a bleed and arthritis and pain you already have in uh, in damaged joints. Right. No, that's, that's a great question. And I'm just gonna, I, I just saw Sherry commented in that half-life is 28 days. So I was completely wrong. Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> so, um, so no, I mean, great question. How do you tell a bleed from other, from arthritis and other things? You know, and this is where for the inhibitor patients, there's a lot of that kind of retraining that, you know, it, it was one of the strange things, I mean, for me as a treater, it was a strange thing to tell people, you know what, is it red, is it swollen? No, well, you know, give it two hours and see if it gets worse, which honestly is something I never would have said 10 years ago. Like, you know, 10 years ago, you call me and you say, I think I'm bleeding, I'm gonna say treat. But, you know, what we know from the data is, is you know, two thirds of people have no bleeds with inhibitors on Hemlibra. You know, more than that have no bleeds without inhibitors. So, you know, really, it's, it's very unlikely you're gonna have a non-traumatic bleed on, it, on anacizumab. So, you know, it's one of those, see how it is, it's, you know, the, the pain is one of the five vital signs, right? It, it's redness, swelling, limited range of motion, all of those things. I, I guess if you've got chronic arthritis, that's how the question came from Tony. Um, you know, if you've got chronic joint issues, it may be hard to tell limitation range of motion, but it is one of those places where you, you can actually give it the discretion of waiting a few minutes, waiting a couple hours to see does it get better? You know, I think some of the stories we heard from the inhibitor patients is they were so liberated by being on Hemlibra, they started doing more. We started getting people calling us with, you know, I think I have a muscle bleed. Like, you don't have a muscle bleed, you have muscle strain. You actually, you've been using muscles that haven't been used. You've been using joints. They actually hurt because you're active. And that's, I mean, that's a fabulous reason to be hurting. And it's, it, it, but it is, it is going to be a learning curve. And I think at least with, with native factor eight, there's not the risk of clots. So especially at the beginning, you know, there's going to be lots of times where you may call and say, I think I'm bleeding. We may say, you know what, why don't you come in and we'll check, you know, the, the physios can do a point of care ultrasound and look for blood. Um, we can see it. We can say, give it a couple hours, put some ice on it, give it a couple hours, let me know. So yeah. I think this brings me to another question that had been previously submitted just so that we could reinforce what you had in your slide then. And the question was, how is this drug utilized in instant, instances of spontaneous bleeds and injury? And I think from your slides, you were telling us that it's a prophylaxis medication. Right. And that yeah. you're still going to rely on your factor eight to deal with anything beyond that. Is that correct? Yeah. Exactly. I mean, emicizumab, Hemlibra is, is for prophylaxis only. It's not, it's not an on-demand treatment. You don't get that quick rise in clotting power. You, it really works by giving you that steady state which is what you want but it means you still that's where it's not the cure you still need to have some factor you know a lot of our discussions now i know uh, dr israel and i have talked about okay you know what are we are we are we just what are we going to use like if you're on if you're on a loctate what are we are we going to use a loctate if you have a bleed are we going to put you you know if you're on 
Cavaltry, are we going to keep using Cavaltry? Which we probably would because it'll work, right? So it it still works, but you still you still do need those if you have a if you have a bleed. Well, I know you you said that we sh there's no fear of using heme libra to um, cause factor eight inhibitors, but is there any chance of getting an inhibitor to heme libra? Well, so there are. I mean, there were a few that showed up in the studies. They're, we call them anti drug antibodies. So. Um, I can't recall offhand from Haven 3. There, there were a few, there were very few. Um, I think there was, because it was study, it was done in context of study, you know, you'd stop the hem libra. And one, I, I remember one patient did successfully start up again, the antibody went away. Um, that is a risk. Yeah, there are, this is not a native protein, so it looks different. Because it, it's an antibody itself, it's not as likely to stimulate other antibodies, but it could, we, we could see. And again, this is the best of times worth the times, right? We Studies are great, but they're very controlled. And it's when you start getting into real world utilization that you go, okay, now we're starting to learn how does it really work? I mean, we were part of one of the real world studies for the inhibitor patients. Um, and now that we're into the kind of, it, it's out there, it's being used broadly across the developed world. You know, we have an opportunity to kind of learn some of those answers. Um. Here's a question. Are there any new studies done on uh, about efficiency of heme libra on moderate or mild patients, or have they always used severe? They've always stuck to the severes just because they're the ones who kind of benefit the most from it. But there's no reason it shouldn't work. I mean, it really, it, it's there. It's, it should work. There's no reason it wouldn't. It wouldn't work. It's a question of kind of need. And this is where, you know, it basically turns you into a mild patient. So it's unlikely a mild patient is gonna get a lot of benefit from being on Hemlibra. The, the question, and this is really goes to that kind of slide about the, the non severe is well, what about the moderates? What about somebody whose factor eight is 2% and they've got a target joint and they're bleeding and we have them on you know three times weekly extended half-life prophylaxis. They would probably benefit from Hemlibra because they, they behave, it's the clinical behavior that's different. Um. There was a question about how likely are we to move to heme libra treatment? So I guess other than being severe hemophilia A, are there any caveats? Um, it, if you're a severe A, does that automatically qualify you? Or are there any other stipulations that you're looking nope. for? No, I mean, right, right. You know, the, the current access guidelines are factor eight, less than 1%. You're eligible to get heme libra or inhibitor. Okay. So. Um, so we have a, a person asking who will be the distributor of this medication, CVS or pharmacy? So, so this is a source of ongoing discussion. So it, it is being, so it's being purchased by Canadian Blood Services using, you know, the, the funds from the Ministry of Health as they've always done for blood products. In Manitoba, because this is a medication with a drug information number, what I've learned is that by Manitoba law, it must be dispensed through pharmacy. Um, I don't know why this is true of Hemlibra when it's not true of other drugs that have, you know, other, Cavaltry has a DIN number. Um, and I'm asking some questions and I've actually talked to CBS about this, but you know, as it stands right now in Manitoba, it has to be dispensed through a pharmacy. The blood banks won't touch it. Um, and as again, as of right now, the only pharmacy that is getting it from Canadian Blood Services is the one at Health Sciences Center. So. So they're, they're acquiring it, you know, they are being, they're not paying for it. They're getting it from Canadian Blood Services um, and they're dispensing it onto the families. And we're, you know, there's a lot of work in advocacy all the time is, is how do we get that out to the patients and uh, particularly for our rural patients. I know Christine, we had talked about this last week um, and I've reached out already to Canadian Blood Services to say like, it's just, you know, we need to find other ways of getting this out to the rural communities other than having it dispensed through Health Sciences Winnipeg and somehow transported out to, you know, other places. So we're working on that. But as it stands for, for whatever reason in Manitoba, it has to be a pharmacy. Okay. Um, we have a, another question. Can you develop an immunity to heme libra? And I think what they mean is, um, Will your body get used to it and stop? It'll stop working for you. Have, has there ever no. been an instance of no. that? No, just I mean, just the anti-drug antibodies. So if you developed an antibody to it, then it wouldn't work. But 
you know, it it works it works by just doing what it doing what it does. It, it it's designed for basically one one half to stick to factor nine a and one half to stick to factor ten. So there's there's nothing that would get in the way of doing that. I mean, I suppose I should never say never, but uh, you know, from from all that we know and from just a kind of physiology of it, you know, other than developing an antibody to hem lever, there's nothing that should block it from working. Okay. Um. So there. Uh... Oh, here's another question about uh, dispension. Um, is this available in other provinces, specifically provinces east of Manitoba? So it's it's available nationally, right? So you know, for for Cat, you know, the Cadith ruling um, applies to everywhere but Quebec, uh, and Ines changed their ruling too, and and is carrying it. So it's it's available in all the provinces. Manitoba is the only one that has to come through a pharmacy. Everywhere else is going to blood banks. So. All of, the, all of the provinces are in the same process right now of kind of seeing patients, filling out the name patient contracts, writing the prescriptions, you know, submitting it in. Oh, there was a, there, you know, you, you were talking about in the Haven studies, somebody asked, sent in a question in advance asking about the burning pain, that they are specifically having pain, uh, burning pain when administering this medication and what can be done about it. Yeah. I mean, that was the commonest thing they found on, on Haven, the injection site reactions. Um, and I'm not even sure how specific it is to Hemlibro because I, you know, I can think of other sub-Q drugs that we use that that's a common complaint. And some of that is it's just the stinging of the stuff in the, in the, the, the suspension that they, they supply it in. Some of it is just, it stretches, right? Your skin, you know, as your skin stretches, it hurts. It's, you know, lots of people have lots of different ways of doing it. You know, it's, there are, you know, I know we talked about this a little bit before, you know, there's, there's um, topical anesthetic creams that you can use. They might help, but they, you know, you put them on, they have to be on for about a half an hour. They definitely take away the poke of the needle, although with the tiny needles, it's not that big a poke. A lot of them don't take away the deeper stretch. Um, you know, I've, I've seen all sorts of things. You can, you can kind of pinch the skin, you raise it up a little bit so it doesn't stretch. You pull it flat so that it kind of forces in you know, ice cubes, um, there's all sorts of, there's um, the Buzzy D that we've used to kind of distraction tools. It's, you know, it's a, uh, yeah, it, kind of figuring out whatever works for you. I, I'm a big fan, honestly, I think ice cubes are the best anesthetic. Don't hold them on your skin for like 10 minutes till you get a frostbite, but, <laughs> but you know, like the, the, the topical anesthetic, I, I do this for lots of kids, like they like the topical anesthetic cream, but you gotta have it on for half an hour to get it to work. Right? Take an ice cube, hold it on your skin for 30 seconds, do your job, you're done. And yeah. and then you wipe it off and it's an ice cube. So I know there was a there was another nice little tool called a shot blocker, which is uh, considerably less costly than a buzzy bee. Buzzy bee. because uh, I think the, the least expensive buzzy bee I could find was about $145. So that's that's a that's an investment. Uh, but these shot blockers, um, the the chapter will get some. So if you're finding you're having difficulty, especially with children, this is a new a new uh, way of doing medication that um, that we should be able to have them in the chapter and you can ask and, and we'll hopefully it'll offer you some some relief from that. Um, so if there are there any other questions out there I've got one last very profound question to ask Dr. Stoffman but if anybody else has any other questions first I'll, I'll give you a moment. Okay, here we go. Um, in a world where a person's first job is expected to be manual labor, so like a restaurant server, a fast food cook, a cashier, etc., how should a hemophiliac from a lower economic background survive on their own in these physically demanding jobs when they cannot rely upon family to pay for things like housing and food? <laughs> so, I, I, yeah, I mean, you gave me a heads up on this one before. Thank you. So, but I mean, this is this is a tough. It's a tough question, and I mean, I, I was very fortunate to be able to spend five years working with the hemophilia program in India, or six years with the the Indian program. And you know, it's managing hemophilia in a in a resource restricted country is very very challenging, um, especially because many of the jobs there are these you know manual labor kind of jobs. Um, you know, the, I, I hope, and I think as we see these novel therapies, it actually helps to improve access. And some of it, I know when I was in India, you know, they were, they were a great site of the clinical trials. So a lot of these new, new, 
hemophilia products were being put through clinical trials. And lots of patients who don't have regular access, you know, you can question the ethics of this study a little bit is if you, if you don't have options to prophylaxis, unless you go on the trial, you're going to go on the trial, but it still gets you access to great drugs. So there's, there's that opportunity. The other thing I know we, we've talked a lot about kind of at the World Federation of Hemophilia level is as the developed world gets newer and newer therapies, the current therapies are still there. So there's less demand on them, the cost goes down, there's more supply. So, you know, there's an opportunity as the developed world switches to things like Hemlibra that the EHL products drop in price to the point where the developing world is now able to acquire them. And, and I think there's, there's opportunities there. The other opportunity is that these novel therapies as they kind of come into the market, just become the go-to, right? As, as countries start looking, uh, I remember when I was in India, even they, they would talk about the fact that, you know, in India, they've stopped worrying about landlines. They just jumped right to cell phones because it was the newest technology, but in the big picture, it made more sense to jump on the new technology than to build up the old technology. So, so you know, I'm, I'm hopeful all these new products, I mean, they, it's always kind of that inequity that the developed world benefits first, but I do, I do think there's a good trickle down into the developing world that will help 